Uh, so moving along here in uh, John David Ebert uh, 101, uh, we're up to uh, lecture number five. Uh, and in this one, we'll be talking about the evolution of shamanism, uh, starting in the Paleolithic and then coming down to the present day. Um, and the portal, let's say from the, the previous uh, lecture into shamanism is of course, uh, Gene Gebser's uh, magical consciousness structure uh, in which the shaman is, is part of the magical structure, which is the oldest of, of his structures other than the archaic, but that's pre-cultural. Um, the magical is, is the birth of human culture uh, in the Paleolithic. And um, it is tied to hunters and hunting. Wherever we find hunters, we're going to find that the religion is almost invariably that of shamanism. So shamanism is the oldest form of religiosity in the world. Um, it can be traced all the way back into the Paleolithic, probably into the lower Paleolithic with uh, the Neanderthals, who do appear to have had uh, shamanism. Uh, the Neanderthals were the first to bury their dead. The proto-Neanderthals, uh, going back about 400,000 years ago, were the first to bury their dead, as far as we know, by simply throwing the bodies into a pit called Cima de los Huesos in Spain, the Pit of the Bones at Atapuerca. Uh, and inside this is, uh, you look down through this hole and there's all these dead bodies that they obviously throwed down into the hole. That's the almost oldest form of, of burial that we know of. So we have that, and we also have the later Neanderthals of about 100,000 years ago in Europe, uh, worshiping cave bears. We find collections of cave bear skulls, um, and the cave bear may therefore be the er oldest worshiped divinity in the world. And we find the spread of shamanism, um, still to this day we have vestiges of it in the circumpolar zone. So the circumpolar north is where the hunting cults survive and hunting cultures uh, such as the Eskimo, or going up the, uh, what Joseph Campbell calls the, sh the shamanic zone of the, the Northern Pacific there along Alaska, down the Northwest Pacific coast with the Quack Yule there, uh, the Aleutian Islands, uh, and then across the way into Siberia, which is a huge zone of shamanism, uh, the Tungus shamans and the Chukchi uh, shamans, all over Siberia, going back to Northern Europe and Finland in, in particular, also, it survives there. Um, and the Kalevala is the Finnish national epic. And that book is loaded with all kinds of uh, shamanic feats that the heroes perform, one of which is indeed uh, the sacrifice of a bear. Um, and we have the Eskimo with the polar bear. Uh, so the bear, does, the bear cults do seem to survive in this uh, circumpolar region, sacrificing the bear. But it doesn't matter what the animal is. Um, the shaman is the one who forms a bond with the animal. Um, so what happens then is that the shaman is a, an unusual individual for some reason who has had a calling, but maybe the calling, it, and it's very often the case, as we can attest from burials, uh, that these individuals are deformed. Um, and a lot of them are female, especially from the site uh, 20,000 BC of Delny Vestinice, which was uh, a major goddess site, a creation of some of the finest goddess figurines came out of that site. Um, and there's even one uh, in Palestine, uh, a Natufian shaman woman there dating from about 10,000 BC. So this is at the terminal range here of classic shamanism in its formative period. Uh, and we find her buried, she, she was also crippled, and we find her buried with lots of animal bones and animal parts and wing birds and so forth, uh, birds of wings. Um, and all, there's also, she must have been a very powerful shaman because uh, they buried her with very large, heavy stones on the top of her grave. They were afraid, uh, obviously, that she might get out of that grave and walk. So, they're, they're <laughs> and the shaman is a very revered and also simultaneously feared individual. Uh, Joseph Campbell gives accounts in his book, The Historical Atlas of World Mythology, of lone Eskimo shamans, uh, Najagnik and Iktagarjuk, uh, who went to war against their entire tribes. The one guy just wanted a wife, and he had to kidnap her uh, and hold himself up in his house and sh shoot uh, at, the, at the tribe. And then when they captured this guy and took him into court, um, everybody refused to testify against him. And so the case was dropped. They were terrified of him. Uh, and so the shaman is, is in a rather perilous situa situation with respect to the tribe. He's absolutely essential. But the problem with that is that if anything goes wrong, somebody gets sick, there's a plague, he gets blamed for it. Um, because it's the job of the shaman now not just to do medicine. Uh, the medicine man, later on, as we'll see, does that. Uh, but the shaman handles uh, the, the medicinal aspects as well as the astral plane. 
the relationship to the other side and the other world, and especially the animal powers. So very often a, a shaman might be somebody who's been attacked by an animal. So this individual then has to go out into the wilderness by him or herself on a vision quest. Uh, it simply goes out uh, into the forest or the tundra or where, wherever it happens to be and basically starve themselves. They, they undergo a fast and they wait for visions to come. Uh, normally probably visions of animal spirits. The animal master is the, uh, the animal equivalent of a shaman who's a sort of a half human, half animal type creature that will come to him and make a bond with him, a covenant. So there's a covenant in these hunting societies with the animals that this tribe depends on for its food. And so the shaman also has to be aware of where the herds are at at any given time. If there's a famine or a drought or whatever, uh, it's his job to go into the astral plane and look down and see where the herds are so that he, he can give them, as it were, a bird's eye view. And shamans then, um, when they come back, uh, during that vision quest, though, I, I want to mention this, uh, one of the most common recounts, uh, common accounts, and this is very popular in amongst Australian Aboriginal shamans, is that the shaman will see himself in vision being torn apart by the ancestors. Uh, he or she will encounter ancestral beings that will tear him apart, pull out his organs, and replace them with uh, precious uh, jewels, such as quartz, uh, crystals, or maybe metal like iron. Um, and then, so he'll now have a rebuilt inside uh, that is a, what the Buddhists would call a diamond body, basically, it's, it's indestructible. And the shaman also has the ability to, he has sort of x-ray vision. He has to be able to see through you, as it were, in order to diagnose you, to see where the blockage is inside of you, let's say. Um, and so whether he actually does or not, um, I don't know, <laughs> but maybe, um, but anyhow, it's interesting that, uh, our superheroes, many of them have shamanic abilities, such as Superman has x-ray vision and Wolverine is a character that is, uh, where the internal anatomy has been redesigned with a metal called adamantium. Uh, so he has a, a kind of sh shamanic ability. Um, so th the job of the shaman then is to connect with the astral plane. And normally what he does is he'll through drumming, it can also be through psychedelics and hallucinogens, but normally it's through drumming. The drum will activate uh, a trance state, and the shaman will go into this trance state, transform into a bird in the trance state, and fly up to the upper world, or possibly down into the underworld, uh, along a world tree, a central cosmic axis that is very often uh, analogized to the pole star around which everything else turns. And if someone has gotten sick, the theory is that the person's soul has been kidnapped by a bird or a demon or an animal and taken to this astral world. So the shaman transforms himself into a bird and goes up the world tree and he finds the soul of the sick person. It might be in a bird's nest uh, or in any kind of other condition. It might be in a box somewhere. Fairy tales have echoes of this. It goes up, finds it and brings it back and restores the person to health. And the shaman better be good at this. Otherwise, as I've said, he'll get blamed. Uh, and he won't be a shaman for very long. Uh, they'll kill him in these societies. And they are, they're always suspecting in these societies. They have what Borkenau, Franz Borkenau calls death paranoia. Um, there is no such thing as an accident in these societies. Some rival shaman somewhere has put a curse on us to make this accident happen. If somebody gets eaten by an animal, some other shaman has put a curse on us. So our local shaman needs to fight with him. Uh, so that's the thing. Shamans can, can get blamed. So th they really are in, in a precarious situation with respect to their, their social orders. So this is the Paleolithic version of the shaman. Now, when high civilization begins to bubble up and come in uh, with the Neolithic in the Middle East, and we've already seen the burial of one shaman woman in the Middle East, uh, the Natufian shaman woman. Um, the Natufians may have been the first to invent agriculture, about 12,000 BC in um, Palestine. And there, uh, what we get is uh, the shift into agriculture. So when you get, let, let's say, uh, what Joseph Campbell calls the way of the animal powers, shifts to the way of the seeded earth. Um, then we start getting priests who come in. And the priest is a very different phenomenon from the shaman. The shaman begins to get marginalized. Uh, and in some myths, such as in the Hikarilla Apache myths, you can see that the shamans are turned into clowns. Um, they, they show up in the myths as, as goofballs and clowns, uh, while the official order is represented by the priest. And the difference between the priest and the shaman is that 
The priest uh, does not go on a vision quest. The priest is simply inheriting a fixed body of symbols, rituals, liturgies, dogma. They're simply passed along to him. He doesn't have to go undergo the ordeal of a vision quest and come back to the tribe with a highly idiosyncratic and individualistic set of symbols. Uh, so the shaman still represents, uh, to a certain extent, individuality within that world. Uh, not so, but by the time we get to the Neolithic, we're starting to get human sacrifice, displacing animal sacrifice, uh, and the priest is the one who officiates over this, and uh, then we start getting the shaman turning up as the medicine man. Now the shaman is just in charge of medicinal purposes uh, and begins to lose the connection with the astral plane as him being the primary bearer of uh, the relationship to the astral plane. Now it's the priest. And then as civilization evolves and changes and we get into high civilization, the Bronze Age, 3500 BC, what we saw last time is the first generation of civilization with the Mesopotamians on the one hand and the Egyptians on the other. Now we get the priest running the whole show. Uh, we get literacy coming in, uh, writing is invented at a rook, 3500 BC, and also mathematics, the sexagesimal and the decimal systems come into being as the result of the priests studying these, the stars. Uh, so these priests are also have to be astrologers at the same time. So you begin to get astrology coming in, and all of this presupposes literacy and writing. Uh, so the priest is the one who is in charge of the cosmic cycles. Every eight years, Venus comes back to the same spot in the sky. The priest has to know that. <coughs> every 12 years, Jupiter makes a, a solar return. Uh, every 28 years, Saturn makes a return, and so forth. So it's the priest's job to know the will of the stars. So we get the shift in what, into what Joseph Campbell now calls the way of the celestial lights, which is the inspiring mythos for high civilization, uh, what Toynbee calls the first generation of civilization, uh, and what uh, Gebser would call the mythical consciousness structure. Coming into being here, and the priest becomes now the central figure, the ruler, the one who guards fate. And each of the high civilizations, each one of them has a different idea of fate. Uh, the Mesopotamians called it May, M-E, and um, the May is plural, actually. They're, they're, they're plural for some reason in Mesopotamia. Or in Egypt, Mat, M-A-A-T, uh, the goddess Mat, who is represented by a feather. Um, the Tao in China, Karma in India, Moira in Greece weird in uh, our civilization, the Northwestern Faustian, each one has a different inflection of fate and a different way that it relates to fate. But astrology was normally regarded in the ancient world as deterministic and fatalistic. Um, so it was pushed out. Um, now, the Indo-Aryans had something to do with this. We saw that the third of Spangler's Tehran Amibi, uh, Amibi, the, the Tehran, the Tehranian, which is basically the Indo-European, Indo-Aryan, peoples who come down from the north uh, during the second generation of civilization and they bring in the philosophical mentality eventually um, but they are the ones who are who bring in all the dragon slayer myths uh, and, and the Semites do as well coming up out of the Syro Arabian deserts uh, they come from different directions but they have the same mentality they ride two-wheeled horse chariots um, they are masters of the horse uh, and they are very violent individuals and they have nothing but disdain for the priest uh, they're not literate, these peoples, uh, the Indo-Aryans, Indo-Europeans. They, they they're strictly oral-based. They don't bring literacy with them. And the priestess we have seen for astrology presupposes literacy. So we get the myth of the earliest dragon slayer myth that, that we possess, uh, the, the slaying of Tiamat by Marduk. And Tiamat there is a monstrous dragon who has 11 companions. That is, of course, 11 plus her. That's the 12 signs of the zodiac. And Marduk then kills her, kills the companions, and one of them is a, is a guy named Kingu uh, who has the tablets uh, containing all the maze within them. So that's, there it is. That's the priest, the astrologer, the guy who's in charge of this cosmic fatalism. But Indo-Aryans will have nothing to do with cosmic fatalism. They reject it completely. And so these dragon slayer myths represent the overturning and, and of these older first generation uh, mythologies uh, that are deterministic. So the Indo-Aryan dragon slayer uh, isn't... Uh, a pawn of fate or a puppet of the stars. He has his own free will. He will do as he pleases. This goes all the way down to Beowulf. Um, so it's a complete rejection of that worldview and of that order. So we can see these strata uh, in the myths there. And so in the West then, um, astrology falls out, although it makes a, a brief comeback during the Hellenistic and early Roman Imperial period there. Um, 
it comes in and becomes a vogue for a while. It becomes very popular. People love to have their horoscopes and their birth charts read. All that stuff is going on. Uh, but then it eventually drops out, most likely due to Christianity coming in now. Christianity is a priestly religion par excellence, but not a fatalistic one. So they reject astrology. Uh, both the, uh, the Jews and the Christians uh, reject astrology in favor of uh, individual freedom of the will. Free will becomes uh, the primary thing. So Christianity comes in, displaces astrology, and it drops out of the West. Um, it comes back in then when the Northern West, the Faustian civilization, begins to get up and running again. Um, Kepler might have been the last one, Johannes Kepler might have been the last one uh, to be an astrologer who was also an, a, 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 what was called a natural philosopher or a natural scientist. Uh, we refer to him as an astronomer today. Then it drops out again from about 1600 all the way down to uh, the end of the 19th century when it makes a comeback. And it is making a big comeback now. But we've, of course, we're back now on the turn of the spiral to a similar kind of Hellenistic imperial age of cosmopolitan, megalopolitan cities. Um, so it's interesting how this, it comes back in accord with what Spengler calls the second religiousness that comes in in the tail end of civilizations in tandem with Caesarism and the formation of a universal state. And Toynbee also terms this the formation of a universal church. Uh, Christianity is the universal church. Uh, the Roman Empire is the universal state. Um, uh, but it ends up being a whole new civilization that Christianity uh, in, ends up establishing and founding. So then, um, as we then come to Faustian civilization, in a certain sense now, we have the return of shamanism to, to a certain degree in the West, insofar as Western civilization, uh, the Faustian, not, not so much the Greco-Roman in this sense, but the Western civilization uh, is not, Spangler treats it as the youngest of the high civilizations, but in a way, as we have just seen, we could actually regard it as the oldest of all these civilizations because shamanism originated in Paleolithic Europe. That's where it came from. Whether it was the Neanderthals or the Cro-Magnons, doesn't matter. Either way, it comes out of Paleolithic Europe. Um, and so shamanism, as we've seen, in contrast to the religions, all priestly religions, uh, emphasizes the individual vision quest, the unique individual. And so Faustian civilization the destiny idea here is weird, W-Y-R-D, which means destiny that unfolds from within you. It doesn't come from the stars. It doesn't come from the outer world, the macrocosm. It comes from within you, the microcosm. This eventually becomes the German word uh, werden, for to become. And with Jung, it becomes Menschwerdung, the individuation process, the process of individualizing, individuating, becoming who uh, and what you really are in essence, in potentia. Uh, and actualizing that potentiali potentiality in your lifetime. So we have this metaphysical mythos that of all the high civilizations is the most sophisticated regarding uh, individuality and individual fate. Um, and it comes out of our civilization, this, this emphasis on individuality, um, all the way down from Beowulf where it first appears. Uh, and note that Beowulf is carrying on that old Indo-Aryan uh, uh, monster hunter, dragon slayer mentality um, so it's not an accident that weird first appears there um, and then unfolds, uh, goes along the line all the way down to the great novelists of the 20th century like James Joyce and Thomas Mann. These are individuals who themselves are on their own individual vision quest. Um, and they provide then what Joseph Campbell calls creative mythology uh, in his four volume epic Masks, The Masks of God, the first volume being primitive mythology where he covers shamanism and the early Neolithic and the second volume uh, being Oxi uh, Oriental mythology, where he covers uh, the Oriental world, and then Occidental mythology with the West. And then so finally he says, with the, with the death of all of these great structuring world religions, um, and them dying out through the process of the various scientific revolutions that have happened since about the year 1500, all the way down to relativity and quantum mechanics, um, those cosmologies no longer sing to us. They no longer organize our world and tell us where we're at. It's our poets and artists now who do that. They have inherited the job of the shaman. They are the ones, the poets, the artists, the filmmakers. Um, they are the ones who still embody and represent for us this principle of individuality. They go out on their own private vision quests and they bring back the visions to the tribe, which happens now to be a megalopolitan, gigantic civilization. So there are lots of them. Uh, but they are the ones uh, who, in their films, in the films of Francis Ford Coppola, Steven Spielberg, or who, whoever you, you want, who came out of that 
60s film school generation, uh, they are now providing the myths to us that used to be supplied by the highbrow literary artists like James Joyce and Thomas Mann and Marcel Proust and Kafka and, and so forth. So th that is where we are at now with, in, in a sense, uh, at the tail end of our civilization, uh, shamanism has returned in terms of its vision quest aspect. We have turned over the healing aspects of it to the medical profession, but the medical profession only treats the physical body, doesn't even treat the etheric body, just the physical body. Uh, whereas the visionary aspect now has been uh, taken up over by these poets and artists. And so uh, that brings us to the end of uh, lecture five. And next we'll look at uh, appropriately then uh, the cosmology of the afterlife.